booktube it's missy and today i'm here to share with you guys my third hook and read uh, on this channel um the thing that's different about this particular hook and read is it's also an unhaul i have gone through all of these books i definitely don't want them but i did want to read to you guys the you know first paragraph or so from each book to, you know, kind of grab and hook you into knowing whether you want these books. I'm on the fence. I don't know if I want to do tradeaways for these or just straight give them to you um, because I am very close to 4,000 subscribers and I always do a big giveaway um, for those events. So yeah, let's get started. The first book I have here is Revenge of the Shadow King by Derek Benz and J.S. Lewis. I purchased this from my local library bookstore for a dollar, I think in 2016. I always meant to read this because it's a middle grade and it's fantasy and I figured, oh, it'll be a fun book, but the reviews are awful. I've never been able to commit to buying the rest of the series. I didn't even add this to my Goodreads as a want to read book. So I've always been on the fence and because I have been I just I don't want it anymore. Um, this book is about four friends who find themselves in a dangerous quest to save their town from wicked creatures that come to life from their card game. So I don't know what this is supposed to be like. If you look at Goodreads, there's a lot of bad reviews saying that it's trying to be too many things at one time. So yeah, let's read the first paragraph, shall we? Uh, they, they say that this book is written uh, like all the kids are stupid, which we all know that kids can be very smart. All right, I skipped the prologue. I am on Chapter one, it's all in the cards. Here we go. Avalon, Minnesota. Okay, <clears throat> it's in the United States. Was a perfectly boring town. That is, it was both perfect and boring, all at the same time. Every yard was beautifully manicured and each garden was overgrown with flowers worthy of a blue ribbon at the county fair. It was also quite small. There was a single street light, one bank, a grocery store, and one screen movie house that was closed on Sundays. Parents let their children play outside after dark, and nobody ever locked a front door. In fact, Avalon was a town where every perfect day was just like the day before, and would be in turn just like the next. While this might seem refreshing to somebody from a bustling city filled with noisy cars, towering skyscrapers, traffic jams, and police sirens, to Grayson Maximilian Summer III, or Max, as he preferred. Avalon's serenity was a perfect nightmare. Yeah, that, that's a lot of words in one paragraph. Um, did that grab you? Was Avalon someplace that you wanted to visit? A small town in Minnesota? I don't know. I don't know. It didn't sound like the boy was dumb or anything. And it doesn't say anything about what the book is about within that first paragraph. Those are the kinds of books that I like that really grab you at the beginning. All we know is that we have a boring town. And I don't want to read about a boring town, and I definitely don't want a boring book. So there you go. Uh, the next... Oh, by the way, this is a series. This is the first book in the Grey Griffins series. I don't know how many books are in here. I've seen several sequels to this at Book Off and never purchased them. I don't know. The next book I want to talk about is The Poison Diaries and this is also a series. There are three that I know of two that I own. It's called the Poison Diaries series. And this book, I can never find the author, is by Mary Rose Wood, based on a concept by the Duchess of Northumberland. I don't, I don't know what that means. 
but uh, yeah, let's let's just go to chapter one. And this is a gothic tale of romance and murder. It's a historical fiction fantasy romance. So there. And the first chapter is very small. Actually, all of these, if you can see that, all of the, the pages are, are quite short. So there's not that many words per page. So this should be a fast read if I wanted to read it. 15th of March. So we have some kind of diary entry. Gray skies. The rain came and went all morning. A cold wind blew in gusts, worsening as the day went on, until the lowest branch of the great chestnut tree in the courtyard splintered down the middle and crashed to the ground. If I had been standing underneath, I would have been crushed. Spun wool after breakfast, read for a short while, but my eyes ached too much for sewing to continue long, changed the soak water for the belladonna seeds. Father's still not home. It has been two days. Let's keep reading. The berries of the belladonna plant are beautiful. I have always thought so. I would string the plump black pearls on silk thread and wear them around my neck if they were not so deadly. The seeds are nearly as poisonous as the berries. Father has warned me a thousand times, but I am careful. First I tie the seeds in a clean muslin bag and drop them in a pail of cold water. Before they can be planted, they must soak for at least two weeks, and I must change the water every day. That is how Mother Nature would do it. The snow would fall and melt and then fall again, and it would be too risky to leave the seeds in the ground during the cold months. They might get eaten by birds and carried away to grow in some distant field, where they could wreck their mischief without warning. Instead, I make believe a winter for them to trick them into growing only when and where I wish. So, again, not enthused by this book. Next, we have Lux by Anna Goberson. I have the entire series. I collected them over a couple of months. These are all from Book Outlet. So is this, by the way, if you're curious. This one's also from Book Outlet. Um, I bought these because I saw somebody on, on YouTube or, you know, on BookTube with these books. And I was like, oh, well, she has these books. I want these books, too. If she likes them, I should also like them. Uh, this is also a series. Like I said, I have all four of the books. This is... 1899 Manhattan or Gossip Girl in the late 19th century? Yeah. <laughs> I can never say it correctly. It's like, I will, I'll say the 1800s, like the late 1800s, because I can never remember what century it is. Isn't that bad? Anyways, 1899 Gossip Girl. It's about backstabbing and true love. It's a historical fiction romance. And I don't want to read romance. And I, I thought it would be fun to read something catty, but hmm, I'm just not interested anymore. These pages are, they seem very long because the font is so small, but these books are so nice and floppy. So if you like YA romance and you want a whole series, uh, this might be for you. Okay. <clears throat> let's let's start, shall we? In life, Elizabeth Adora Holland was known not only for her loveliness, but also for her moral character. So it was fair to assume that in the afterlife, she would occupy a lofty seat with an especially good view. If Elizabeth had looked down from the heavenly perch one particular October morning on the proceedings of her own funeral, she would have been honored to see that all of New York's best families had turned out to say goodbye. They crowded Broadway with their black horse-drawn carriages, proceeding gravely toward the corner of East 10th Street, where the Grace Church stood. Even though there was currently no sun or rain, their servants sheltered them with great black umbrellas, hiding their faces, etched with shock and sadness from the public's prying eyes. 
Elizabeth would have approved of their somberness and also of their indifferent attitude to the curious work-a-day people pressed up to the police barricades. The crowds had come to wonder it at the passing of that perfect 18-year-old girl whose glittering evenings had been recounted in the morning papers to brighten their days. A cold snap had greeted all of New York that morning, rendering the sky above an unfathomable gray. It was Reverend Needlehouse murmured at his carriage pulled up to the church, as if God could no longer imagine beauty now that Elizabeth Holland no longer walked his earth. The pallbearers nodded in agreement as they followed the reverend onto the street and into the shadow of the Gothic-style church. So is Elizabeth Adora Holland dead, or is she imagining this is what it would be like for her funeral? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> it's not a terrible beginning, but it's four books long, and I just don't want to. I don't want to. All right, I bought that in 2014, by the way. I meant to tell you guys when I bought these books, so that way you know, hey, they've been on my shelves too long, and I'm being good and taking them off my shelf since I haven't read them yet. All right, the next book, huh, this is gonna be a long video, uh, is called The Bewitching Season. This is also the Leland uh, Sisters, yeah, the Leland Sisters series. There are three books in this. It is a fantasy historical fiction romance about sisters with magical abilities, they um, are going to school to for magic, and it is set in London in 1837. I purchased this in 2014, never picked it up. Again, I have all the books. Uh, I do, however, really enjoy uh, like the the pages. Like, look look at how beautiful those chapter headers are. I love it. All right. <clears throat> April 1837, Mages Tutoreau, Hampshire, England. My God, Percy, you killed him. I did not. The Honorable Perse Persephone Leland snapped back at her twin sister Penelope, who was perched on the battered schoolroom table. She rubbed her damp palms on her apron. They still tingled, the way they usually did after she'd cast a spell, and looked anxiously at her little brother, sprawled, pale and motionless on the faded Turkish carpet in front of her. What would she say to Mama? I seem to have killed Charles during lessons this morning. Would probably not go over well as a conversation starter at lunch. She turned to her governess. Oh, Allie, I did it just like the other times. Miss Allardyce had assigned them halting spells today. While Penn watched, Percy had stopped Charles in his tracks a dozen times with her command of Repilar Statum, but this time her spell's force had not only halted him but also knocked him over backward. She dropped to the floor and grabbed one of his limp hands. Charles, please, are you all right? Miss Allardyce sighed, Penelope, do not take the Lord's name in vain. A true lady is known for her conduct under trying circumstances. And Charles, get up for before your sister has hysterics. I know you're hoaxing us. She bent and gave one of his brown curls a sharp tug. Percy exhaled in relief as her brother opened his eyes and gave her an impudent grin. Gotcha, Percy! He sprang up and held out a hand to her. Tell me you weren't just a little worried. <laughs> This actually sounds fun, um, but again, it's it's three books long, um, and it's got, I don't know, mixed reviews, and it's a romance. Out of all of the series that I have purchased in 2014, like the Lux series and the Poison Diaries, along with these ones, I bought them all around the exact same time. This one sounds the most promising, and... There is, uh, it sounds really funny, almost like a parasol protectorate kind of thing, but I just, I don't think I'll pick them up anytime soon. So this is what people say on BookTube all the time. If I get an inclination to read this, I will just borrow it from the library. The library does not carry this book. 
then I'm shit out of luck. Um, but even though it sounds really cute and I love, you know, fantasy when it's based on magic and surrounding sisters or families. I just don't think I'll read this soon. So hopefully I can give it to a good home and one of you guys can tell me all about it and then, you know, I'll, it'll make me feel like I read the series. All right, the last, is it my last? No. The next fantasy I have is called Finnegan of the Rock. I purchased this while I was in San Jose at a diner. Like I went to a Mexican restaurant that was like famous for their breakfasts in San Jose and the breakfast, my gosh, it was amazing. It was so, so good. But while we were waiting because the lines were out the door for this restaurant, they had a library cart just sitting in the waiting area where you would, you know, drop in some money into the little box and then you could just take a book. And it was cute. I loved it and this was a dollar and I had to have it, so I bought it. Uh, I bought this because I had heard about it on booktube, but this is high fantasy and I'm not interested in reading it. This is the first in a series and it's the Lumetier Chronicles, I believe. It's about a murder, a curse, and a long lost prince who was found after, you know, several years. And like I said, it's a high fantasy romance adventure. So, there is a map in here, so that's cool. Let us start, skip the prologue, part one, The Novice, chapter one. <clears throat> when it finally appeared in the distance, Finnegan wondered if it was some phantom half imagined in the soulless kingdom at the end of the world. There had always been talk that this land had been forsaken by the gods, yet perched at the top of the rocky outcrop, cloaked in blue-gray mist, was proof to the contrary, the clo cloister of the goddess Lagrami. From where they stood, the flat expanse that led to its fortified entrance resembled the softness of sand over a desert. Finnegan could see a trail of pilgrims with their heads bent low, sacks across their shoulders, and staves in their hand. They made a line across the low-lying country like tiny, insignificant ants at the mercy of the nothingness surrounding them. We must hurry, the king's first man urged, speaking the Sarnak language. Sir Topher had decided that once they reached this wasteland of Sendicane, they would use the language of the neighboring kingdom to the north. At the inn two nights before, he had made it known that they were pilgrims themselves, holy men who had come to the end of the earth to pay homage at the greatest temple of the blessed goddess Lagrami. To be anything else in this part of the land would rise suspicion and fear, and Finnegan had come to realize that those full of fear were the most dangerous of people. There you go. The first paragraph from this book, and I'm not interested. How's this working for you guys? We're already two, 22 minutes in, so this is a long uh, video, but are these books grabbing you? Let me know down below. All right, the very next one I have here is also a book I purchased in 2014. Uh, Finnegan I got in 2015. Um, this one is a standalone. I don't have very many standalones in this list, and this is called... Damosel, in which the Lady of the Lake renders a frank and often startling account of her wondrous life and times. That's extremely long. Um, by the way, I didn't say, but Finnegan of the Rock is written by Melina Marchetta. And this one is written by Stephanie Spinner. You know, the authors might be nice to know. All right, so this book is a... Water Spirit of Arthinian Mythology. It's, uh, the, the Water Spirit makes a promise to Merlin to protect King Arthur and then betrays Merlin and tries to go against her promise. Um, I'm not into Arthinian fantasy, so maybe one of you guys would like this. Uh, it says here for chapter one, <clears throat> I am so well versed in the rules governing the ladies of the lake 
that I could recite them backward on a dare. But the wisdom I treasure most was gleaned not from the vast ancient compendium, but from my own earnest blundering. To wit, learn the rules so you know when to break them. It took me half a lifetime to understand this. Long ago I had no inkling. I was a feckless young lake spirit, living in a damp contentment in a place called Loopool. My home was deep and wide, the limpid blue of an, aquari of an aquamarine. Because it was only a stone's throw from the ocean, I could hear waves breaking day and night. A steady, soothing sound, like a giant breathing through a stuffy nose. Should we move on or keep going? Let's do one more. Grand as the ocean was, nothing compared to my lake, for its water was refreshing in summer, bracing in winter, and unlike the surf, very drinkable. I loved its taste of duck's feet and shale. I treasured solitude in those days, so I kept the lake hidden. It was a feat well within my powers, for as a lady, I commanded significant magic, just as my forebears had. There are severe restrictions to what I can divulge. A lady does not discuss her ancestry at her training. But I will say that I could obscure most things, including myself, to mere shadows, and could move from one element to another as smoothly as rain gliding off a leaf. Like other ladies, I knew countless helping and hindering spells, and I need hardly mention that I was bewitching, with every sort of glamour at my disposal, from the subtler ones all the way up to the dizzying, the blinding, and the stupefying. Hmm. No thanks. All right. The last three books I want to oh, share with you guys are all sci-fi books. And uh, I, I bought... I bought two of the books from the Dollar Tree and one from Book Off. So this one I purchased in 2015. This is a sci-fi alien book. I thought, ooh, aliens, so cool. Um, this is also a series called the Conquered Earth series. It's about aliens that conquer Earth and there's a telepathic super signal that reduces the humans to subservience. Um, but it only affects adults. So kids up until their early 20s are not affected by this signal. So this book is about like a post-apocalyptic or a dystopian world ran by kids because all the adults serve the aliens. And I don't want to read about kids ruling the planet. I never want to read that. Uh, there is a, a book from Michael Grant, like a whole series, like the Gone series, which is about kids that, you know, make decisions. I don't want to read that. I never want to read that. So when I found out that it was about kids, you know, doing stuff, I was like, Neh. no, thank you. All right. <clears throat> Part one, Conquered Earth. Oh, man, there's a lot of words on these pages. I'm just going to read until I get to the end and then stop because I don't want to do that. Uh, the first chapter is called Vultures. Right about then it became official. Holt Hawkins was having a bad day. Hey, you're right! One of the kids shouted, reaching for him underneath the crumpled old truck. There is someone under here! The kids yanked him out from under the ruined vehicle and slammed him hard against its rusted door. They were younger than Holt, but not by much. Seventeen or eighteen, he guessed, looking at the black vein-like growths crawling through their eyes, the telltale sign of the tone. The tone is the signal. It had a firm hold on them now. It meant their time was running out. Oh, okay, so up until they're in their early 20s, they're totally fine, but it can catch them as they age. So it's not like the kids are stuck as youngsters. Good to know. Um, Holt sized them up quickly. They were shorter and thinner, weaker, less quick, probably, but those things mattered a lot less when you had guns or knives, and these kids had both. Holt had left his with Max near the tree line, not wanting to risk the weight of the precarious bridge, a decision he was quickly coming to regret. The six kids holding him had small tattoos on their wrists, the one with his forearm pinning Holt to the door sported a scorpion. 
Two more, knives at the ready, had a coiled snake and a heart, respectively. The wrist tattoos were bad news. It meant these kids were in the menagerie, and the situation had just gotten a whole lot worse. Then again, Holt thought, maybe they wouldn't recognize him. He glanced at the single fingerless glove he always wore on his right hand. Hey, guys! A heedless! Look at his eyes! One of them pointed out bitterly. They were right. Holt was heedless. One of the rare few on the planet the tone didn't affect. His eyes were perfectly clear. There were no signs of the of the crawling black tendrils. It was the only reason Holt had made it to his 20 years of age. Isn't Tiberius looking for a heedless out here somewhere? Tall guy like this one? Holt grimaced, so much for not being recognized. He peered upward, looking for any sign of the ship. There were no clouds, the sun was high, and in the blue sky it would blend in perfectly. He had no way of knowing it was even there, which was unfortunate because it was probably his only shot at getting out of this. Not bad. This is actually something that sounds pretty good, even though it is about kids running the world, so... I don't want to read it, but it didn't sound bad, so maybe one of you guys want to read it. The next book I have here, again, I got from the Dollar Tree. This is called Liminal States by Zach Parsons. And the reason why I did it again, Midnight City is by J. Barton Mitchell. All right, back to Liminal States. Uh, I bought this because it says it's a sci-fi horror. So I was all about that. It's about um, a man in 1874 who was dying in the desert, so it's kind of a Western. And uh, he comes across a pool, and when he drinks from it, he ends up becoming immortal. Now, I read the synopsis on Goodreads, and... There is this woman that our main character is in love with, but she's married. And when he goes back, once he's like rejuvenated from dying in the desert and becoming immortal, he goes back to get her, even though she's married, and finds out that she has died during childbirth. He's so upset, he takes the husband back to the desert and throws him into the pool. So now both of them are immortal and then they duke it out for centuries later. Like, that doesn't sound horrific at all. I mean, it sounds like a horrible book, but it doesn't sound like it's a horror-based book. So I don't know what that means. And then the sci-fi, is it because now they're immortal? I don't know. I don't know. It, it doesn't sound good. I'm not interested, but I will definitely read you Woo! Those are some tiny little words, too. My goodness. There's no, there's no chapter name. Oh, wait. This must be the prologue. Yeah, that must be the prologue. Okay, so we have 1874. You can't see that. 1874, The Builder. Chapter 1. It was the stone horse called Apollon that stomped cruelty into him. The beast stood nineteen hands, and every man was afraid to go near, its hooves and mane wild and black, black and untamed as its eyes. It was not ridden. It did not toil in the field. The unbroken giant was proof that man could not subject every beast to his will. By its size and defiance, it became a mythical creature. Apollon breathed morning smoke, exhaled and snorted in such great gusts it seemed it could breathe fire as well. Gideon Long was never more afraid than when he stood before Apollon. His father watched him from behind the gate, one foot up on the second rail, a gentle smile in a place to hide what he was doing. Go on, he said. Go on in there, boy. Brush his hide. Placed between the forces of his raw fear of, his, of this enormous beast and his fear of his father's disappointment, Gideon ducked beneath the railing and entered the stall. He took with him the camel brush and the metal curry comb. Apollon watched and snorted and crowded him with its muscular presence. Gideon slowly put the comb to the horse's flank. He brushed away a year of rolling in dust. 
He combed out the burrs and scabs and every bit of filth that had clung to a pollen's hide. The beast tensed beneath the teeth of the comb, but did not move or lash out. When Gideon was done, he looked to his father, still on the other side of the gate. Harlan Long said to his boy, Go on, go on and comb his mane. Apollon's mane was badly tangled. Gideon climbed to the stool and stood behind the snorting beast. With tiny hands, he lifted the bone teeth of the comb to their hair, and with slow, deliberate, terrified strokes, he smoothed the knots from Apollon's mane. At last he finished the task, and he looked again to his father, still with one boot up on the second rail. I don't know. When I, I know... I know the plot where the, you know, the two guys are fighting. I don't have any qualms about the boy and the, the horse or anything, but meh. <sighs> All right. <clears throat> Last book. We have Off World by Robin Parrish. Now, this one is, oop. I keep having to go back because I, I don't pay attention. This is a standalone, okay? So it's just one book, thank goodness. Uh, but this one is the first in another series called, what did I call it? What's it called? What's it called? Dangerous Times. Now this one sounds pretty good, but at the same time, I just, I don't know if I want to start this series. So I bought this in 2014 from Book Off. It's about astronauts coming home from Mars, and once they reach like atmosphere they lose contact with nasa's like control like um ground control and uh, when they land they don't find anybody not not one human or animal alive it's like they vanished out of thin air but it says here they might not really be alone so I'm assuming it's aliens, right? So this is a sci-fi, post-apocalyptic, mystery Christian fiction. So I want it to be aliens. I don't know if I want to read this. Not because it's Christian fiction, just because I just don't want to start another series. And particularly this year, I'm only reading horror. So this sci-fi has got to go because I won't read it. Uh, but let's, let's read the first the first chapter. Oh God, not the first chapter. Whew. Let's let's read the first paragraph from the first chapter. We have one. This thing of darkness is what it's called. All right, August eleventh, twenty thirty-two. Ooh, that's coming up. Right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. Stumble. Red dirt filled Burke's field of view. Not that it was much of a change. Red dirt had been all he could see for hours. Even the bright pinkish tan of the planet's sky was washed away by the sandstorm. Beach! he called out, hoisting himself back to his feet as the wind spun him around. He carried a small black pack with a few meager supplies and some mission equipment inside. I've got zero visibility, no orientation, I can't see anything. He stopped. Burke's training fought against the fear creeping into his mind against the rising panic as the wind fed more soil and dust into the crevices of his spacesuit. Got to find my way. Dirt's building up. Soon I won't be able to move. Habitat, this is Burke, he yelled over the storm. I can't see anything, and I've lost contact with Beecham. No answer. A brutal gust surged around him like the gale force of a hurricane, threatening to pick him up off his feet. He crouched to, his center, to center his weight slung the pack over his back, and took a steadying breath. Houston? He tried half-heartedly. There was little chance the relay satellite orbiting above would pick him up if the rest of his own team couldn't hear him from less than a hundred miles away. Is anyone reading me? No reply. Not even static. The earpiece inside his helmet was dead. Okay, Chris, think. You're in the middle of a dried-up riverbed that we've been studying for weeks. You know your way around this place. Think about landmarks. What's nearby? The wind cleared just enough for him to glance, to catch a glimpse of a red boulder directly ahead of his position. Burke crawled forward on hands and knees and stooped there in the shadow of the large rock to rest and think. Fighting the dust storm had required all of his strength, every muscle ready to crumple from the effort. 
He brushed aside the deep red dust on his right arm and uncovered an electronic readout on the underside. It read 5.08 p.m., which meant he had about four hours of oxygen remaining in his suit. And worse, nightfall would come in less than an hour. Martian days were just 39 minutes longer than days on Earth. So sunrise and sunset were virtually the same on the red planet as on the blue one. So, he thought, lost on the surface of Mars, unable to reach the habitat, unable to see, barely able to move, only four hours of, out of air left, and it's about to get dark and lethally cold. If Dad could see me now. What do you guys think? Is this a keeper? Should I keep this book? I don't know. I mean, it sounds good though, right? But it's, it's a new series, and I don't want to start a new series. But it sounds really good. I like Mars. That's why, that's my, but this isn't about Mars. This is about astronauts coming back from Mars. But who knows when they come back. Okay, here's the deal. I want you to leave me your opinions down below. Uh, what books I should keep and try again, um, and what books I should definitely get rid of. If you are telling me to get rid of the books, it's okay if it's biased because you want them. That's totally fine. Uh, just remember these are unhaul books, and I never unhaul books to my library or, you know, a used bookstore like Book Off that will buy them back. I always give them to you guys. So I do already have a huge stack of books that I'm definitely saving over here for a trade away. These are going to be books that are for free. So all of these books I'm giving away for free. Uh, you do not have to send me a book back. Um, these will be part of my 4,000 subscriber giveaway, which I always do. In my 4,000 subscriber giveaway, I always have a international giveaway, which goes through the book depository. And then I have my US giveaway, which I send, you know, a box of books to everybody. And uh, yeah, let me know down below what you think about all of these books, if you were hooked by them or not. And uh, yeah, that is it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your week, and I will talk to you soon. Bye!